material has been reproduced and communicated to you by or on behalf of the Australian National University in accordance with Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. The material in this communication may be subject to copyright under the Act. Any further reproduction or communication of this material by you must be consistent with the provisions of the Act. Do not reproduce this material. Do not remove this notice. Welcome everyone. Chancellor Julie Bishop, Professor Bruce Christensen, Deputy Director of the School of Medicine and Psychology, book editors, <laughs> Elizabeth Riga, Robert Costanza, Ida Kudrzewski, and Paul Dugdale. Distinguished guests, friends, and colleagues, welcome to you all. I'm Russell Gruen, I'm the Dean of the College of Health and Medicine here at the Australian National University. I acknowledge that we come together today on the land of the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people. We're privileged to share it as a place to live, learn, work and play. I pay my respects to Ngambri and Ngunnawal elders, past and present, and to any First Nations people who are with us today. This acknowledgement, recognition and respect is always important but it's especially important today because there's so much to learn from First Nations people about well-being. I realised this first when, as a young doctor, my wife and I Tari, um, had the privilege of living and working in Gumbalanya, a remote Aboriginal community in Western Arnhem Land for three years. For our Kunwingu friends, neighbours, patients, workmates and teammates, half of whom mightn't reach their 50th birthday, modern medicine seems strangely limited and social determinants of health had huge impact on people's lives. It seemed clear to us that the fragmentation of our medical training in disease and specialty silos hadn't prepared us well to engage with other sectors especially, say, education, food, or community development, that could also make a big difference. And while we're pretty good at treating some illnesses, one patient at a time, we realised that we lacked any real understanding of what it is to be healthy and how to advance what is now called social and emotional well-being. In contrast, this seemed to come more easily to the Kuwingu people. Culture, country, and body, mind, and spirit seem to be naturally interrelated. Connection to the land that had provided food and shelter for generations came with responsibilities to know it well and look after it. Animal totems seemed to engender in children a, a kinship with all creatures that was very different to having a pet. And just as faded jeans, branded shoes, and shop food could be part of the scene at tribal dances and cultural ceremonies, ancestral stories of the spirit world seem to, e be, to easily accommodate modern science. <laughs> Theresa and I often wondered how different things would be if we had a more fluid, agile, and integrated understanding of health and well-being that could incorporate the many dimensions of human experience. Fast forward 20 years, and here we are, launching a first book of its kind about well-being and integrated sciences by a range of experts from a top-tier publishing house. There's even a terrific chapter about Indigenous people's understanding of health and social and emotional well-being. I must say I'm so pleased to live in a jurisdiction, the Australian Capital Territory, <laughs> that promotes well-being to the extent that it talks about a well-being budget. And I'm very proud to be part of a great national university that takes seriously the scientific basis of well-being. If ever there was a danger <laughs> that well-being would be considered woke or new age, it's dispelled by the attention given to the topic 
by serious scientists at our university with our heritage of discovery, curiosity, critical thinking and courage that has won us more Nobel Prizes than all the other universities in Australia put together. That this year our university has taken another bold game-changing step by bringing together its medical school and its school of psychology to create the world's first school of medicine and psychology celebrating the indivisibility and interdependence of body and mind, of physical health and mental health. Respecting the professional disciplines have long histories, we've said loudly to the world that medicine and psychology have much to learn from each other. That patients will be better served by doctors who have a richer understanding of human psychology and by psychologists who can participate more fully in the many aspects of health and well-being. And that the best students will be hungry for that. I hope you feel as excited as I do about being at the leading edge of one of humanity's most important paradigm shifts. The timing of this new book could not be better. It's a milestone and will be a global reference for anyone interested in thinking and learning about how medicine, psychology and other sciences go together to contribute to individual and collective well-being. In a moment, I'll invite the Chancellor to say a few words and to formally launch it. We'll then have five minutes or so from each of the four editors and from Professor Bruce Christensen, after which we'll have a question and answer session and then drinks and canaps in the foyer until about seven o'clock. I now welcome the Chancellor of the Australian National University, the Honourable Julie Bishop, to formally launch this extraordinary new book. Thank you, Russell, and I too acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet this evening, the Ngunnawal Ngambri people, and pay respect to elders past and present. As Chancellor of this remarkable institution, the first and only national university in Australia, I welcome you to this book launch, and I thank Russell for his introduction and Russell and I have been celebrating science at ANU for a couple of days now. For yesterday, we were both present at the 50th anniversary seminar, symposium, that was held here to acknowledge the work of two eminent, remarkable ANU alumnus in Professor John Shine and Lynn Delgano. And they, of course, discovered 50 years ago, the Shine Delgano sequence, which promoted our understanding of basic biology and essentially underpinned uh, the advancement of molecular biology in the global biotech industry, nanotech industry as we know it today. And here we are again, Russell, celebrating eminent professors and academics at ANU in collaboration with others and launching this book toward an integrated science of well-being. Now, I was hoping it would be a little paperback that I could <laughs> flip through on the plane back to Perth, but that's not to be the case. It's quite a weighty tome. But I'm absolutely delighted that we have so many of the contributors and authors here this evening, and indeed the editors, um, Elizabeth and Robert and Ida and Paul, all here in the front row. So it's wonderful to see you all here to um, help celebrate with you the launch of this extraordinary book. As Russell said, it's a first, the first scientific book to um, take a multi-dimensional approach to well-being. And I have learned a new word this week, eudaimonia. Now, for those of you who know classical Greek, you know that that's Aristotle's favourite word, eudaimonia, and I've used it in several sentences over the last day or two, um, much to the 
uh, consternation of a number of people. I think I discombobulated them with my <laughs> weaving of eudaimonia into every other sentence. But essentially, it is um, well-being. It's a good spirit. It's a life well lived. And the opposite of eudaimonia is obviously something um, less attractive. Hedonism, perhaps. Anyway, this book is all about eudaimonia. And it's spelled E-U too, by the way. Um, it brings together the four dimensions of well-being, the uh, psychological, the physical, the socio-cultural, and the environmental. But what I find really interesting about this book and all the different chapters is that while there are separate fields of study represented, uh, we have psychology and medicine and economics and environmental. They're not writing in pillars. They're writing about how each field relates and interconnects with the other in terms of well-being. And it makes for an extraordinary read. So essentially it's how the disciplines relate. And this book is seeking to develop a dialogue between the disciplines so that we have a science of well-being and that will obviously be a, um, an important progression for the health of our planet, of our communities, of our society and of individuals, the coming together of the well-being mind and body. And it proposes a new framework uh, of the science of well-being and this will bring together academics and professionals from all over the world, from developed, developing countries. And at last, we will see a focus on well-being as a science rather than as individual disciplines that are not connected. What I thought was delightful is that the Prime Minister of Bhutan from 2008 to 2013, Thinley, Prime Minister Thinley, wrote the foreword, and it's worth reading in itself. But I was struck by words that he spoke, the Prime Minister spoke, at a meeting at the United Nations in 2012, which Bhutan hosted, and some 800 diverse participants from government and business and NGOs and academia, um, including, I think, Robert and Ida were both there. You were at that meeting. Okay, so you will remember these words in 2012. Uh, and they really present the challenge that this book addresses. We desperately need an economy that serves and nurtures the well-being of all sentient beings on earth and human happiness that comes from living life in harmony with the natural world, with our communities and with our inner selves. We need an economy that will serve humanity, not enslave it. It must prevent the imminent reversal of civilization and flourish within the natural bounds of our planet while ensuring the sustainable, equitable, and meaningful use of precious resources. Now, of course, you will all know that Bhutan measures its success in terms of a um, gross national happiness model or index, rather than gross domestic product, which uh, we measure our prosperity and success. So I think it is highly appropriate that the former Prime Minister of Bhutan should write the foreword to this book. May I encourage you to obtain a copy? I'm sure the authors will tell us where we can get it from. I had to steal this one off um, Brian Schmidt. So um, I am taking it home so Brian can get his own. But I <laughs> encourage you to read this book because it really does put into context what we kind of know, but we want the science behind it to enforce that there is hard evidence to support the notion of well-being as a science. I go running as often as I can in the morning and I know I do it for my mind and my body. It gives me a clarity of thinking that I couldn't get any other way. And so it's that physical and mental, the spiritual, the socio-economic combination that you will find so compelling in this book. Once again, I am so proud of ANU academics that make a contribution nationally and globally to fine works such as this. So it is with great pleasure that I formally launch toward an integrated science of well-being 
and I want you to all use eudaimonia in a sentence tomorrow. Thank you so much, uh, Chancellor, for those wonderful comments. And thank you all for joining with us this evening. It's really heartening to see how many people are invested in this area. My name's Liz Rieger and I'm an academic and clinical psychologist in the School of Medicine and Psychology here at the ANU. Um, our book is divided into four sections. We have a section looking at psychological wellbeing, um, physical health and wellbeing, uh, societal wellbeing and the wellbeing of the built and natural environment. Um, but of course we acknowledge that those distinctions are fairly arbitrary because each of the chapters across each of those sections brings an integrative lens to understanding their subject matter. So I'll be briefly introducing you to the chapters in the psychological section of wellbeing. And we begin uh, with uh, definition. So Carol Riff, who's been a pioneer in wellbeing research over decades, she was doing research on research uh, well before um, wellbeing had, had entered our popular lexicon. Um, and Carol speaks about eudaimonic wellbeing. Julie, I thought I'd just pop that word in, following your advice. Um, her model has been um, empirically supported over decades and she's defined six components of eudaimonic wellbeing, this sense of living life and to reach our potential and, and functioning to our highest potential. Those components are having higher levels of self-acceptance, autonomy, a sense of mastery over our environment, having positive relationships, having a purpose in life and having um, a sense that we're growing throughout our lives. We've called the book Toward an Integrated Science of Wellbeing because we were really keen to uncover the gaps in research so that we can propel research in interesting and fruitful directions. And one of the questions that emerges for me in Carol's uh, chapter um, connects to the international movement that governments are starting to introduce wellbeing indicators to measure um, progress. And here the ACT government has been amongst those pioneering governments in recent years. Our government has introduced um, a, a wellbeing framework which I've pictured there to the right. So the research question that emerges for me is that how do we know what to measure? How, well, how do we know what to include amongst our societal indicators? We need to map those societal indicators against each of these components of psychological well-being. Which, so, which social indicators of well-being are most strongly predictive of psychological well-being? And hence, what are the ones that are really worth investing in so that we can optimally enhance the well-being of our community? to focus in on just one of those components, education and lifelong learning. These are the indicators that are currently being used, but we really need research to tell us, are these the right indicators? Are we missing any indicators? Um, for example, we know that teacher wellbeing is strongly predictive of the quality of the educational offerings that we provide. So do we also need to be measuring teacher wellbeing as just one example? We then move on to look at hedonic wellbeing. So this is the form of wellbeing that looks at positive emotional states and a subjective sense of life satisfaction. We have two chapters on hedonic wellbeing. Christian Wall looks at the positive emotions that are associated with wellbeing and Bob Cummins introduces us to a homeostatic model of subjective wellbeing. Uh, again, just to give you just one example of a research direction coming out of this work. In Christian's chapter, he talks about cross-cultural differences in the wellbeing emotions, how they're experienced and how they're expressed. But there's a paucity of research understanding those cross-cultural differences, which is quite um, concerning and surprising given that emotions are such an intrinsic part of human endeavour. Um, if we think at the macro level, for example, in recent decades there's been an increased emphasis in understanding um, the emotions involved in international relations um, to inform foreign policy and to improve international relations. But almost invariably that focus on emotions has been on negative emotions, for example, anger, humiliation or revenge. We really need to understand cross-cultural differences in positive emotions so that we know how to enhance those emotional experiences and hence our international relationships. 
The next chapter is by Paul Gilbert. He's been a pioneer in compassion research. Paul defines compassion as arising when we intentionally try to alleviate and prevent suffering and distress either in ourselves or in others. Um, but again, the bulk of this research has been conducted at the individual level. So, for example, using compassion-focused therapy to alleviate mental distress. Paul's chapter, though, points us in some really exciting research directions. How can we apply compassion at the larger scale to enhance well-being in our educational settings, uh, in organisational settings, in our communities, in our political life and ultimately in nations themselves? The next two chapters in this section both look at positive relationships and we devoted two chapters to this topic because even though there is variability in different wellbeing models, what they all focus on is the importance of positive relationships to wellbeing. And that relationship is underscored in our first chapter by Bruce Chapman and Nabi Zachariah. They do some really interesting um, statistical analyses of the relationship between partnership quality and life satisfaction. And one of the findings um, that emerges from their work is that being in an unhappy versus a happy relationship has three times the impact on our wellbeing compared to being unemployed versus employed. Positive relationships really matter when it comes to our wellbeing. So how is it that positive relationships enhance our wellbeing? That's the question that's addressed by Harry Reese and Jenny Lee in their chapter. And they focus on this construct, this umbrella construct of perceived partner responsiveness. Our positive relationships help to enhance our wellbeing because in a positive relationship we will experience perceived partner responsiveness. We perceive our partners as responding to us with understanding, validation, and care. Again, the bulk of this research has been focusing at the individual level, looking at our one-to-one -one relationships. Um, but in this chapter, they suggest that we could look at this construct of partner responsiveness to enhance well-being in educational, business, political settings, and in the way that we relate to the environment as our partner. The next chapter looks at Indigenous Australian understandings of wellbeing um, led by Professor Pat Dudgeon and her team. And you can see from that model that the Indigenous conceptualisations of wellbeing are intrinsically holistic. That the self and wellbeing is in, um, intimately connected to family and kinship, community, culture, land and country and spirituality. I find it quite profound to realise that the holistic conceptualisations of Indigenous Australians who are the oldest continuous culture on the planet are now at the cutting edge in leading an integrated science of wellbeing. In their chapter, they also look at culturally appropriate ways of enhancing um, wellbeing. And Professor Helen Milroy shares with us in her chapter her own artwork that she uses um, to enhance the wellbeing of Indigenous Australians. This is just one of um, her pieces. It's called Community Strong Together. And the narrative that begins to be associated with this is that when a community stands strong together, it blossoms, protects us from adversity and is part of our strength and wellbeing going forward. The shapes formed in between the figures represent the hearts shared in the community and the notion that to lose one child will destroy more than one heart. Our final chapter in the psychological section is looking at wellbeing in higher education and Professor Bruce Christensen will be speaking to his chapter shortly. But for now, I'll hand over to Professor Paul Dugdale to talk to us about the um, physical health and wellbeing section of the book. Thanks, Paul. Thank Thanks, Liz. Um, I'm Paul Dugdale. I'm Professor of Public Health in the School of Medicine and Psychology. Uh, you can tell uh, that I'm not a, a real professor like my other co-editors. I'm an honorary professor, and you can tell that because I haven't got a PowerPoint. <laughs> um, uh, I, uh, I started my medical studies at Flinders University back in the 70s. And professor Chubb was our professor of neuro neuroscience there. It was before problem-based learning infected the medical curriculums. And... Uh, the main paradigm was the biopsychosocial model of health. 
we were introduced to it in the first week of first year and it stuck with me all my life. But these days we would probably prefer to talk about the biopsychosocial and environmental model of well-being, uh, at least the uh, Royal Australasian College of Physicians that I'm a, a fellow of is trying to get that picked up to get environment uh, built in to that holistic model of health and well-being. Um, now that's a very big span to integrate across. In my remarks tonight, I'm not going to go through the, the health or medicine book chapters. I know everybody here is going to actually buy a copy and so you can read about them all there. I want to highlight a couple of things that frame our book. And the first is what is an integrated science? And the second is about the being side of well-being. Um, particularly given that my, my co-editors will be talking more about the well side, if you know what's the well side of well-being. The book was conceived at a workshop at University House in ANU on well-being in May 2019, hosted by the College of Health and Medicine, at which the ACT Chief Health Officer announced that the Territory would measure well-being indicators to guide social and economic policy in the Territory. This followed the New Zealand Government's adoption of a well-being framework for their 2019 budget and preceded adoption of well-being as a framework for social and economic policy by other Australian states and recently by the Commonwealth in its 2022 budget and uh, foreshadows the now the uh, Australian Centre for Evaluation, which I'm sure you'll be hearing a lot more about in a wellbeing context and I hope that everybody that works in that centre is forced to read the book before they start. The authors in the book and their chapter contributions consider well-being in a wide variety of topic areas and academic disciplines. This shows us that well-being is a really important concept, that it's actually a useful guide for the investigations of a very wide variety of disciplines. And it's not just academics that are interested in well-being. Our personal well-being is important to each of us, whether we run or we meditate or we look out for each other as family and friends, or whether we do volunteer work or activism work. Our concern for the well-being of others is the very basis for empathy. So we, as the, the editors, contend that well-being is something that if you study it collectively, integrating diverse perspectives, then you can come up with something really interesting and some really impactful findings. That's the point of a science, an integrated science of well-being. But it brings us to the question of how you actually build a science of well-being across multiple disciplines and insist that they talk with each other against the tendency that perhaps everybody in this room has got of wanting to subspecialize so that you can get more publications, you can be, you know, get more insight into the narrower area that subspecialization allows. How do we move away from that and create a dialogue between disciplines? Good science about people must build a dialogue with the people being studied. Whether studying psychology, medicine, economics or politics, it's got to be about a dialogue with the with the subjects of those uh, human sciences. When studying well-being, this dialogue is not just good practice, it's actually part of the scientific method of investigating well-being. Because without that dialogue, we can't begin to understand what being well might actually be. The purpose and the value of things is not confinable to any subspecialty. It emerges through the dialogue across the different domains of life and living on this planet. Similarly, dialogue sits at the heart of an integrated science of well-being and perhaps of any scientific endeavour that spans domains and scales. 
Science at different scales investigates completely different types of problems and uses completely different methods. The method for integrating across the scales and the different problems starts with a dialogue between scientists. It's not optional for us in a science of, of well-being. And if the investigators take the trouble to think about the problems that they're focused on in relation to the problems and findings of their colleagues in other fields of well-being research, both the problem set that we investigate and the usefulness of the findings that, that we discover should be sharpened. At a basic level, this book asks researchers interested in well-being to care about what other researchers in this field think, whatever their discipline, and asks readers to think about and work together for the well-being of the planet, of human society, of our bodies and of our minds. I want to turn now to the being side of well-being. At a fundamental level, this is a book about being. Being is a key concept in every chapter, including the one on systems of care and the experience of dying, of leaving our being behind, by Michael Chapman, one of my favourite chapters. Like our Chancellor, I've got to refer a little bit to the ancient Greeks. It's the ANU after all. The literature of the ancient Greeks gave us the metaphor of time as an ocean and being as a ship, with the bow wave of the ship representing our continually advancing present. Think of that majestic opening sequence of the Master and Commander film, uh, just before the camera focuses in on Russell Crowe. Um, Heidegger, the, the mid 20th century philosopher, explored the intertwining of being with time in his ideas of becoming within the horizon of being. Perhaps the moment when we measure well-being is that moment of being in the present, when the possibilities of the future collapse into the events of the here and now, when our becoming is done. Uh, it's hard stuff to talk about and I'm not very good at it, but I'd like to leave you with a very short poem I came across recently by Sami Mensai, the early 8th century Japanese Buddhist priest. The poem was translated by Meredith McKinley of Braidwood, daughter of the great Australian poet Judith Wright. To what shall I compare this transient world we live in? White retreating waves behind a boat that vanishes rowing into the light of dawn. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. And let's see. <clears throat> ah, here we go. <clears throat> nice to be back in Canberra and to see you all here uh, and all the smiling faces. Uh, so I'll back to academic uh, slides, though. <laughs> I have no poems. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll talk about the uh, societal well being section and the, the chapters that are part of that section. And we had five, five chapters there. Uh, that <clears throat> ranged across a whole spectrum, including one from um, uh, <clears throat> Julie Kim and others about the uh, Bhutan's uh, gross, na gross National Happiness uh, Initiative. Uh, so I'll go through each of those relatively quickly. Uh, we only have five minutes. Um, and I'll show this one, which has a lot of text, of course. Uh, but just to make the point that um, there's been a lot of work on coming up with uh, better ways to measure well-being at the societal scale, the whole, the, the whole society scale, and, uh, from, from small communities all the way up to the nation and, uh, and the whole globe. And you can see this list just starts back in 1990 uh, and goes through a few, um, <clears throat> including the genuine progress indicator that I've, that I've talked about, uh, but it also includes this uh, gross national happiness indicator, which came out in 2008, uh, all the way through uh, some more recent ones, uh, in New Zealand, for example, the New Zealand uh, Living Standards Index. Uh, so Jackie Shermer and, and Robert Taunton and John Goss uh, built this whole framework and described you know, what, what has been the history of well-being indicators uh, across, across time. 
Um, and hopefully you'll see from this and other chapters in the book uh, that there is a lot of work going on and a lot of similarities about uh, what actually should be part of a well-being indicator. Um, <clears throat> in that chapter, they looked at uh, the different domains of existing well-being frameworks uh, and showed that, you know, um, many of those, if, if not all of them, included human health, included standard of living, included education, skills, included environmental health. Uh, so we have some basic ideas of what has to be included if you're talking about uh, an overall assessment of well-being. Um, a large majority included a range of other things, and you know, at least half included uh, several other things, including uh, subjective well-being, social capital, et cetera. So, so there's been a lot of work in this regard. Uh, we're actually doing a class uh, right now at, at UCL where we had the students go and find all of the well-being indicators that they could find out in the literature. Uh, they found 375 uh, so far, uh, and they're still looking. Uh, so there's been a lot of experimentation uh, over, over time by a lot of different people. Uh, I think what's missing, though, and, and I think the next step is how do we build a broad consensus you know, about what, that, uh, what those well-being indicators look like. Uh, like I said, there's a, there is a lot of overlap. There is already a lot of consensus once you start, once you start looking at what people have included in their well-being indicators. Uh, but <clears throat> we, haven't, we haven't brought all of them together. So I think that's, that's the next step. And hopefully that will be happening in the next uh, in the next few years. <clears throat> the uh, Julia Kim and Julia uh, Richardson and um, Toki Tenzin uh, wrote this chapter about the Gross National Happiness um, uh, Initiative, and we already mentioned uh, Jigme Thinley, the former Prime Minister of, uh, of Bhutan, and Bhutan has been uh, very active in this in uh, in developing this framework and actually trying to implement it. And I think one of the unique features of the Bhutan Index is uh, that they focus more on sufficiency uh, rather than anything else across these nine different domains with 33 different indicators. <clears throat> so you can see where they're, where they're going with this, but they do include many of the same things that uh, we've already been talking about and are included in many of the other indicators. So it's time for building that consensus. Carol Graham looked at, took a slightly different approach uh, and looked at what happened uh, with the, uh, uh, the COVID pandemic and how that began to affect uh, well-being in the, in the United States <clears throat> and the increase in, in uh, opioid overdoses, the increase in other kinds of uh, human well-being uh, activities, but caused by a social phenomenon that we, we all experienced. <clears throat> in fact, a glass of water. Yeah. I'm losing my voice. Thanks. In fact, a lot of our book was done during the COVID pandemic, so um, we, uh, we had some time, time on our hands there. <laughs> but um, the other uh, major factor I think that's important to well-being is this, this uh, in increasing inequality in the world, which prevents us from building the social capital and the community relationships that all of the other chapters, I think, have pointed to as being extremely relevant uh, to, uh, to the science of well-being. This is a chapter by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett um, <clears throat> about you know, the influence of income distribution on a whole range of social problems and making the point that uh, we, really need to, we really do need to reduce income inequality if we hope to build communities that can actually support uh, a higher sense of well-being. And Finally, I think there's this chapter by um, Lorenzo Fioramonti and Luca Consimi uh, about an economy centered on human and an ecological well-being. <clears throat> so how do we build those kinds of economies? Uh, it was already mentioned that New Zealand has done a, uh, a well-being budget. Uh, other uh, political institutions are thinking along those lines. I think they need, I think, the kind of science that we're trying to, to produce. What actually does, whoops, sorry. Went back. What actually does contribute uh, to human and ecological well-being? How do we measure it? Uh, and, and more importantly, how do we improve it? What sorts of policies would actually improve this more integrated approach to well-being that we're, we're trying to create? Uh, there are some activities going in that direction. Uh, there's a well-being economy alliance that's been, that's been formed uh, back in 2017. And there's a small uh, vanguard group of governments uh, that, that have been 
uh, working in this direction to develop policies and ways of measuring well-being going forward, uh, <clears throat> uh, led by Nicola Sturgeon uh, back in 2018, and including uh, New Zealand, um, Scotland, Iceland, I think uh, Canada has also joined this group. Uh, but but uh, maybe this is something for Australia to join. What do you think? <laughs> Thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Ida for the last one. Thanks, Bob. You good? Um, so as Paul was speaking, I kept thinking about how cool it would be if ANU was the first university in the world to start a school of well-being. Um, so not sure how to make that happen, but wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, OK, so there, in the environmental chapters, there were four chapters. Um, and they were done by, sorry, I don't know how to stand still when I lecture. Um, <laughs> so they were done by um, people from all over the world, basically. Some experts here at ANU um, and some people from states, um, from Europe, basically experts in their fields. So I'm going to go through the four chapters and kind of give a summary of what they cover. So the first one looked at 87 papers um, that have been published over the past 20 years, basically, specifically looking at the impact of the environment on well-being. And the big conclusion they came to is that although it's critical, it can't stand alone. It has to have that built capital, human capital, social capital, integration to make it work. But if the environment isn't there, well-being falls apart. So it's a critical part, but so are all the other pieces. And we need to remember that providing that integration is important, make sure that people are okay on all those levels. They looked at, for example, at things like hospitals, hospital rooms, this will be to Paul's section, but hospital rooms, for example, that have a view outside the window to nature, people heal a lot quicker. People get better a lot quicker. Prisons with cells that have a view of nature, um, the repeat offenders don't happen as much. So um, there's been a lot of evidence shown. Even things like people having pet or plants tend to have a reduced heart rate, um, lower stress levels. So there is a lot of benefit to having nature around you. And we've all experienced it. Taking a walk through a forest, calming down, having that anxiety being reduced. And it's an important factor that isn't taken into account often enough. Our second chapter looked at the impacts of climate change on well-being. And I think the important thing here is that, yes, climate change impacts a lot of people around the world physically through natural extreme weather, natural disasters, including fires, droughts, floods, which we've experienced a lot of around Canberra um, and Australia in the past few years. But it also impacts us socially. It impacts us economically. Our social bonds with our community change when we go through these droughts, these fires. And there's going to be more of them. And the important thing to realize is that even if we start dealing with climate change today, we will be seeing those impacts, and people will be impacted. So it's important to start trying to adapt to some of it while we also try to mitigate any further damage. So the next one was looking more at the built environment. And in this case, they used the example of classrooms especially modular classrooms, which are becoming a really big thing in US and some parts of Europe. Um, the thing with modular classrooms, like any building, they looked at some of the key features that are required to be there. So for example, the presence of natural light. Talking about the importance, for example, with people learning, they found that ability to learn increases about 25% when there's natural light. So then the question is, how many classrooms at ANU but other universities don't have a single window? Oh, look around you. 
But I know when I, I was here for nine years, when I taught, we often taught in classrooms without windows. But that's not a unique feature to ANU. It's true all over the world. How can people then be asked to focus and learn, truly learn, without natural light? But then there's also things like CO2. So CO2 buildup in a room. If you don't have the proper ventilation, whether it's through systems, but through open windows, your ability to absorb information, um, basic activities, applied activities, focus activities, task orientation, initiative, information orientation, information utilization, breadth of approach, basic strategy, do decrease. And they found, so these, is there a pointer in this? No, no, I did something, sorry. Um, so, and they found basically up to 1,000 ppm and 2,500 ppm in various classrooms. Right now, outside, what, 380 ppm? Maybe higher these days, <laughs> quite higher, 400, yeah. So there's a lot going on there. And so building the right environments. And so in this case, the case study was classrooms. But that's true of any workplace. That's true of our houses. That's true of any built building we put together. How do we make them more efficient and healthier to improve our well-being? And last but not least, um, there was a chapter looking at sustainable well-being through the SDGs. And the idea is that there are these 17 goals with 169 targets, 630 measures approximately, that no single country in the world can measure because there's 17 independent goals. And don't get me wrong, they're great goals. But when you start going into nitty gritty, which unfortunately countries need to, um, they become difficult. One problem is that they are 17 independent goals. They don't build up into an overall goal, sustainable well-being. So let's say if you do a little bit on this one, but you go down on this one. Does that overall increase the well-being in the country or not? So the UN actually does realize this. They're reviewing SDGs, and I think by the end of this year, they're going to um, release a new version with only 20 measures. So that is in progress. Um, and there's a lot of new indicators coming out around the world. So I was at the Beyond Growth conference at the European Parliament two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And there's been a lot of talk about making them actually measurable and doable and how do we do that? Because SDGs can't. But I think the important thing with any measure is that there's an overall goal. And not just an overall goal for a nation, but for communities and for regions. Because different scales require slightly different measures. And I think that's important to remember as well that not every measure can be used for every single scale, okay? So for example, in Australia, life satisfaction, a subset of well-being, is about 7.3. However, there are entire communities in Australia with a life satisfaction of about one, maybe two. Those people are being left behind for various reasons. What's going on there? And I think that's the big question we have to ask with any of those indicators. So, and then, okay. So this is um, the term well-being in different um, languages around the world, which I thought was interesting. But I also wanted to thank all the co-authors. And I know there's quite a few here, so, um, I'd like everyone to give a hand of a round applause to all the co-authors in the audience. Because we're just the measly editors. Um, you guys did all the hard work at actually writing the chapter and doing the research. So thank you for making it possible. And I don't know if I'm handing it off to. <laughs> okay. 
Ah, thanks, Isla. <clears throat> so I'd like to uh, start by acknowledging and thanking my co-author, Rebecca Kennedy, who also serves as the chair of the United States University Health Promoting Campus Network. Um, I would like to also thank the editors of the book, um, Liz, Robert, Ida, and Paul, for their visionary approach to well-being, for inviting us to contribute a chapter, and for asking me to live, deliver a summary here as we launch this important and timely volume. It's, it's my honor to be here. Um, our chapter set out to critically review the empirical and policy evidence supporting well-being initiatives at institutes of higher education. Um, in doing so, and to meet the innovative uh, remit of this book, uh, Integration, which is at the heart of this volume, it adopts a framework for understanding well-being that goes beyond subjective well-being. These ideas have their roots in the World Health Organization's 1998 framework to establish the Health Promoting Universities International Network. Um, at the 2015 International Conference uh, of this network, 380 delegates ratified the Okanagan Charter. Reflected in the Charter is an evolving conception of well-being that includes the integration of physical and mental health, the necessity of social connectedness and justice, and the sustainability of the planet. It also recognizes universities not only as beneficiaries of integrated well-being, but as generators and challengers and, com uh, and commentators on this effort. Succinctly, the Okanagan Charter seeks to ensure the well-being of person, place, and planet. Typical foci under these different domains include subjective uh, well-being and interpersonal connectedness under person, cultural and economic well-being under place, and ecosystem and global well-being under planet. And it is under these chapters, uh, under these domains that our chapter is organized. But before I talk about the evidence around initiatives in institutes of higher education, I want to first position uh, the scope of the problem. And here, I think it's important to first address a common myth. Because institutes of higher education are well known to foster creativity, collaboration, and personal growth, they are often viewed as places of considerable privilege and places that have very little psychosocial risk. The truth of the matter, though, is quite different. A large body of research demonstrates very high rates of mental health problems and serious threats to well-being. Let me share a couple of examples from the literature. From the largest survey of students conducted in the UK, we could see very high rates of mental health disorders, help seeking for these problems, and thoughts of self-harm. Other large surveys and meta-analyses show that there are common problems on campus, including depression, eating disorders, anxiety, and non-suicidal self-harm, again, at alarming rates. And the problems are similar in Australia and much higher than for same-aged peers in the community. Here, we see uh, prevalence rates five to six times higher for significant psychological distress amongst university students compared to their community peers. And although our chapter focuses on students, university staff are not free from threats to well-being. The most comprehensive survey of academic staff was conducted by the Wellcome Trust in 2020. And it points to considerable issues with well-being, including those related to workload, to interpersonal conflict, and to mental health problems. And one might ask, why should institutes of higher education be concerned about student well-being? Well, the reasons are numerous. In addition to our fiduciary and ethical responsibility to students, a robust research literature shows that improved well-being positively impacts students' academic performance, research capacity, degree completion, future earnings, productivity, creativity, and engagement in socially responsible acts. Yet more convincing research shows how successful university students propel a nation's intellectual capital and economic growth. 
And furthermore, in a crowded marketplace where students' awareness and concern with well-being is increasing, institutes of higher education are presented with a real opportunity to attract the very best talent by deliberately cultivating on-campus well-being. So what does the research and policy literature say about effective strategies that institutes of higher learning can use to promote well-being? The most notable investment at uh, institutes of higher education have been, at the person level, 60 years of investment in health and counseling centers. This research shows excellent efficacy, especially for mindfulness and cognitive-based interventions. However, it shows that most counseling centers are also under-resourced and that accessibility and treatment duration can be challenging, especially for moderate intensity problems. Institutes of higher education have also uh, promoted recreational programs to improve well-being. And the research here shows, while less mature, that sports programs, exercise programs, yoga, art, and creative programs, and social programs have a positive impact. A strategy showing less empirical evidence, however, is psychoeducation, where students are provided with instructional sessions, often online, about how to improve well-being. Place-based approaches generally target larger sections of campus and emphasize environmental, economic, social, and cultural factors needed to create environments that cultivate well-being. While policies support place strategies or place-based strategies, empirical studies are sparse. Nonetheless, two areas have gained strong research support. The use of binary grading systems as opposed to continuous or multi-level systems reliably lower stress and burnout and emotional exhaustion in students while increasing social cohesion without affecting academic performance. Similarly, well-being courses, which directly target students' well-being, are also positive. An excellent example is a course offered here at the ANU called the Well-Being Formula, the Science and Practice of Making a Good Life. Unique to this course, in addition to reviewing the scholarship surrounding well-being, is the assignment to students of different exercises each week to bolster their well-being practice. Afloha Khan, a clinical PhD student here at the ANU, has evaluated the impact of this course against appropriate control conditions by measuring well-being at the start of this course, the end of this course, and into the following semester. She shows that the course is associated with gains in well-being over the first semester, that it buffers against drops in well-being typical of control conditions, and further promotes continued well-being over the next semester. Similarly, promising but early results have been shown for on-campus structural strategies to reduce substance misuse, including alcohol-free social and extracurricular options, creating mis, um, uh, create, uh, reducing um, uh, substance abuse, including uh, creating health-promoting norms, restricting the promotion of alcohol on campus, and campus community promotions of awareness and responsible beverage service. Similarly, recent research has shown the positive impact of providing green spaces uh, and access to nature. And several institutes of higher education have reported on the benefits of programs supporting students' transition through their first year. Key to these interventions is the impact of social support. A compelling example of this approach comes from a study published in Science in 2011. Walton and Cohen randomly assigned first-year students to listen to a brief third-person narrative from a senior student that frames social adversity as shared and short-lived. The narrative encouraged students to attribute adversity to common transient adjustment processes and not to personal deficits or ethnic identity. Participants then were also required to write an essay conveying their own experience that echoed those in the narrative and to um, 
record a speech based on this essay uh, to a video camera. Altogether, this exercise took students about an hour to complete. The intervention had a profound impact, especially on minority students. In the graphs I'm about to show you, the black bars uh, denote the active um, intervention, and the results were reported separately for students from European and African heritage. You could see here that this simple intervention significantly reduced minority students' belonging uncertainty, increased their GPA, and increased their self-assessed health. Institutes of higher education around the globe are also making considerable efforts to create campus environments that are inclusive and supportive of cultural diversity, sexual and gender diversity, and students with disabilities. Although the policy evidence for these programs is strong, empirical evaluations of these same programs is limited and highly warranted in the future. Similarly, programs to prevent um, sexual and gender-based violence are also common but rarely evaluated. The relatively few research studies assessing the effectiveness of these programs have mostly focused on self-defense and bystander interventions. Few scholars have turned their attention to studying um, the prevention and mechanisms of cultural change necessary to reduce violence and promote acceptance. A very important well-being environment for HDR students is their supervisory relationship. Across English-speaking countries, as many as 40% of PhD students terminate their degree, with some studies showing that the major reason is for lack of support from their supervisor. Not surprisingly, when researchers' supervisors are surveyed, they concentrate on providing students with instrumental guidance, such as laboratory techniques and scientific writing. However, a study conducted by Alex Roach, Liz Rieger, and myself used discrete conjoint analysis uh, and computational modeling to quantify the importance of supervisor attributes among a sample of over 600 HDR students. While both instrumental and psychosocial attributes were important, the most favored attributes were those of an interpersonal nature, ethical integrity, constructive feedback, open communication, and bonding. Based on this research, we have now developed the first brief 23-item psychometrically sound instrument that canvasses both instrumental and psychosocial skills in measuring the quality of research supervision. Perhaps not surprisingly, planet-level interventions are among the most understudied and represent the largest future growth area for promoting well-being at institutes of higher education. Scholarly reviews have suggested campus barriers to climate action. And there is lots of policy support for adding curriculum on sustainability, for adoption of BREAM and LED, or, or LEED certification framework to increase uh, sustainability, for the positive impact of sustainability projects and campaigns, and for the need for campaigns to link improved sustainability to improved health and well-being. In conclusion, institutes of higher education are well accepted as special places of intellectual, social, and creative generativity. But they should also be cast as environments with unique psycho psychosocial challenges and risks. It is imperative that we accept this reality and develop strategies to optimize well-being on university campuses. This review and several recently authored guidelines such as the Australian University Mental Health Framework published in 2020, converge to underscore the importance of whole of university approaches, committed action-oriented leadership, incorporating student voices and lived experience, fostering diversity and inclu in inclusion, and providing effective and timely services. Within these efforts, it's important to enhance 
access to evidence-based psychological and counseling services. While these services are especially effective, they're not always available to those that need them. Moreover, institutes of higher education should develop strategic and coordinated approaches to place-level well-being. With the express goal of creating well-being promoting classroom, interpersonal, community, and physical environments. This is an area that is in sharp need of more research. Currently, there's a very sparse, there are very sparse and disparate data on the longitudinal well-being of university students in Australia. Such efforts are desperately needed to elevate policy to an evidence-based approach that should include students as central collaborators under well-articulated frameworks for participatory research and community development, such as those at the center of the student as partners movement and at the center of structures such as living labs. Universities have the capability and perspective to move beyond monitoring, reporting, and risk mitigation towards understanding the root causes of psychosocial suffering, unwanted behaviors, and community inaction. Understanding that will promote real and lasting cultural change. Urgently, institutes of higher education need to understand and promote the connectedness of individual well-being with the well-being of the planet. This integrative perspective, which is at the heart of this new book, is essential for holistic action that will both lift our well-being and ensure our very existence for generations to come. Again, I thank the editors and I thank you for your attention. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks to the editors. Now, we were going to have a panel, but I reckon you wanted something to eat and drink and an informal conversation with the, the authors and the editors. So I just want someone to tell us how to get the book. <laughs> <laughs>